So hello, local and international art lovers. Thank you so much for being here today with all of us. Um, I'm Cousin Chang, uh, the assistant curator at Parasite. And uh, before we start our uh, panel discussion, I just want to express my gratitude to Art Basel for organizing such a dynamic edition and bringing back a uh, wonderful energy in town. Our panel discussion is titled A Mirror Mirror on Transgressive, uh, on transgressive Art of Candle Pop and Performance. And uh, you know, I would like to thank Stephanie as well to, you know, curate this panel discussion and have this fabulous lineup, you know, with all the talented artists over here with um, Sinway Kin, Rainbow Chan, and Ming Wong. And I'm absolutely, you know, delighted to be able to moderate this session. So, um, you know, this for me is such an exciting topic. Um, a few months ago, I curated a group exhibition titled Fanatic Heart at Parasite, where I invited 15 uh, Southeast Asian and East Asian artists to discern social political debates through the lens of fandom. And this uh, talk is pretty much, you know, like an extension of the discussion. And uh, so together with the free artists, uh, who are basically vanguard of uh, candle kind of pop, uh, art, and performance. We will uh, discuss uh, on um, you know the ever ever present legacies of Cantonese opera, um, you know the beauty of candle kind of pop music and culture, as well as wrapping up you know how we can imagine fandom or pop music or pop culture as a methodology for us to understand and make sense of the world that we're living in. So uh, perhaps before we dive into the panel discussion, maybe I would like to invite uh, each of the speaker and the artist to just briefly introduce your practice and work. So you know, in, in case you know, in the audience we have uh, fo new, new followers of your work. So maybe Wei Kin, you can start first. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Sin Wei Kin. I am an artist uh, working across various mediums, including moving image, performance, uh, installation, sound, and print, to uh, reimagine uh, our relationships with our bodies and our bodies' relationships to the world. Um, and this includes a focus on thinking about um, binaries that exist in society, um, including gender, but also thinking about things like self and other. Um, fantasy and reality, performance and authenticity, and how all of these things are intrinsically linked. Um, my work was the first set of images that you saw. Um, yeah, I have a, uh, a work in the current exhibition um, at uh, Daigun at the moment, um, uh, which is, um, it's uh, in the reception, it's the first works that you see, some of the stills were, um, uh, were in the slideshow. Hi everyone, I'm Rainbow Chan, uh, I'm a musician and artist. I work across pop music, I'm a producer and vocalist. And I also make um, installations comprising silk paintings that reimagine traditional Hong Kong folk songs. Uh, I have a background is, as a singer and a performer, and I've moved into more gallery and museum spaces now. I explore um, notions of authenticity and translation, and that draws from my personal experiences of growing up as a Hong Kong Chinese person in Australia. So I grew up in Sydney. I was born here, but um, lived in Sydney for many years, and I've currently just moved to Melbourne. Um, it's nice to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Ming Wong. It's great to be back in Hong Kong. It's great to be back in Art Basel, Hong Kong. After such a long break, I haven't been back for three years. And uh, I've been coming to Hong Kong regularly since 2010 for research um, uh, and, and, uh, and exhibitions. I'm, uh, I'm Singapore born, uh, based in Berlin, um, working with, um, I hate to talk about my own work, <laughs> you know. Uh, a lot of the themes are actually um, very similar to what, uh, what Joaquin and Rainbow have mentioned. Um, um, uh, I've been, what, there's some images going on in, in the slideshow and those are recent projects that I did in Singapore. Uh, they also link to the, the research that I've been doing over the last 10 years, which is looking into the, the legacy of uh, 
Cantonese opera in Hong Kong and uh, and and, uh, and cinema and, and also uh, thinking about uh, futurity, uh, speculative fictions, and trying to kind of uh, map out a connection between the two. All right, thank you for the lovely introduction of each of your works. I want to start with something more lighthearted. So um, maybe each of you can share some of your first memorable encounter of Cantonese pop culture, perhaps. Maybe you know some anecdotes when you, in your, from your childhood, perhaps. Should we go in a line? <laughs> Um, okay, so I think my first introduction to, um, I mean, Cantonese opera uh, was um, growing up, my grandmother used to pick me up from school and we would go back to her home and she, um, her main kind of hobby was um, singing Cantonese opera karaoke. Um, so this was like really in my consciousness from uh, a young age. She would, um, or she ran like a group at the community center with um, her friends, uh, like other elderly Cantonese um, immigrant, immigrants from Hong Kong. Um, and they would have like an annual um, like showcase at the community center. And she would force me to like learn some songs and like perform on stage. And I was like a really shy kid and I would like forget the lyrics um, often in the middle of a performance. And these were like kind of my first experiences of performing as well. Um, but I think what was like one of, one of the most striking things about it was like, this was also one of my first r really like core memories of like queerness and like Cantonese culture um, together because her favorite actors were Yang Kim Fai and Bat Shu Sin who are two women who played romantic roles opposite each other really often. So I would like see on screen these two women who are kind of like professing their love for each other and singing about how they would rather die than be apart. Um, and to me, this was something that was really queer, but um, for her somehow it wasn't, but it was still this medium that we, um, you know, we, 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 we bonded over together. Oh. Cantonese opera or pop? Both. You both? Yeah. Well, Cantonese opera, I guess, I do remember going to see it in Hong Kong with my mum when I was really young, before my, I migrated. I just remember it being really hot and the bamboo scaffolding and the singing and that being, I guess, quite, um, not necessarily as formative as pop music for me, but it definitely um, created a texture in the background of my understanding of music or the kind of instrumentation and the singing styles. But I think the thing that I really loved was boy band, Aaron Kwok. According to my mum, my first words were lyrics to his song, like, boo, boo, I, boo, I. <laughs> it wasn't mum, it was his lyrics. And I used to actually prance around my house and tell everyone to call me Mrs Kwok and that my name is not Rainbow, I'm Gok Thai, please. So um, for me, Canto Pop has always been in my blood, I guess, and moving to Australia at a very young age in 1996, that era of um, Cantonese pop songs, I think, for me, is really nostalgic, and I draw upon it a lot in my work and kind of just in my general interests um, because it's like a time that time capsule of um, that moment of the uh, fork, you know, in the road trying to choose this path. And so, yeah, it's a very, uh, for me, it's a very important kind of symbol of that turning point. So being the granddaddy of the group, I'm going to go back decades. <laughs> if you were growing up in Singapore in the 70s, 80s, on a Sunday night, all the streets are deserted because everybody uh, goes home to watch these TVB series. And it was still in Cantonese at the time. Uh, and so, uh, music-wise, everybody could sing the theme songs, of course, of all these great series, uh, TV series. And at the time, it was, um, it was cassettes <laughs> that we used to listen to, to, to the music with. Um, Cantonese opera, of course, was a kind of forerunner for a lot of this kind of canto pop. Uh, uh, phenomenon, and um, uh, my aunt actually is a, is a Cantonese opera actress in Singapore. She's like the Singapore sister of the of the community here in Hong Kong. And I would go and watch. I was the only only one from my generation who would be patient enough to follow my grandma and sit through all of these like uh, Canto operas. So, yeah. 
Cool. Well, thank you for sharing your more personal experiences. Um, Ming, I actually wanted to extend your ideas uh, in terms of your affinity with um, Cantonese opera, because I remember the recent works that you've been um, you know, doing is you try to bridge uh, Cantonese opera with something that seems just too impossible to incorporate, which is science fiction. And I had you know, the chance to see uh, both the installation and some of more the um, work on paper, more like frameworks in um, a gallery in Singapore. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit more how, you know, w how do you think there is like a, you know, intersection of these two different genres perhaps and how do you make, keep, you know, incorporating uh, maybe aesthetics of Cantonese opera or any elements of it into this more futuristic uh, genre? Okay, f first of all, um, m my main inspiration is uh, cinema history. And I've been uh, making uh, lots of bodies of work inspired by uh, what is called world cinema and reenacting uh, a lot of the iconic um, moments in, in world cinema, often playing all the roles myself, forcing myself to play a different gender, nationality, speak a different language, have a different kind of body, etc. And um, coming to Hong Kong in 2010 onwards was my way of coming back to my uh, roots, if you, if you can call it. Um, I say that because growing up in Singapore, gradually over the years, we have lost our kind of um, uh, more particular um, uh, um, dialect-based identity. We all learn Mandarin in school, for example. So Hong Kong, Hong Kong has always been the mothership of Cantonese culture for me, through pop culture, of course. And I started to study the, the history of cinema uh, in Hong Kong, and it all started with Cantonese opera cinema back in the 30s and 40s, when opera troops would travel to uh, perform for the overseas Cantonese communities, uh, especially in Southeast Asia and in California. And that's where they encountered Hollywood and they brought it back to China via, via Hong Kong. They were making all these great innovative uh, Hong Kong Cantonese uh, opera movies, uh, adapting what they had seen and heard and, 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 and experienced in America. So they brought uh, modern storylines, music, musical instruments, uh, ideas of aesthetics uh, uh, and mass media uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, so that's what I arrived in Hong Kong for. I wanted to look into this. But of course, uh, I was also curious about what was going on in, in, in Hong Kong at the time. I mean, it's been more than 10 years. And during that time, you know, Aunt Basel arrived in Hong Kong. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, unrest with the younger generation. And uh, I kind of vicariously kind of like uh, uh, experienced that through 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 friends, through, through, through colleagues. And all of that kind of um, spurred one to think about where, where everything is heading to. What is the future? What is that? Um, what are people thinking about uh, when they think about the future? Is there, uh, is there a sense of, uh, is there science fiction in, uh, in this part of the world, in, 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 in the Chinese speaking world? And, and there have been very many different chapters in Taiwan, Hong Kong, but also in mainland China. And so the research also included looking at um, the history of science fiction uh, in this part of the world. And so this parallel strands of uh, research uh, was, was kind of, I was kind of like uh, in between these two threads. And as an artist, I, I was making projects that tried to bridge the two. So uh, in, all, in all different forms, in, in, in the, in the cinema, in the, in the aesthetics uh, of, uh, of costume, of, uh, of the structures, the bamboo theaters, the, the, what I call it, the kind of uh, the bamboo spaceships that you have in Hong Kong and also that we also have in, uh, in Singapore. And some of the recent work actually is a kind of a Singapore chapter of that, looking at the, 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 the legacies and extending that through thinking about the future. I would go on, but <laughs> I think we, we should carry on with it. 
Um, I'm particularly more uh, quite interested in like a, a work by you in 2015 uh, called "Looking at the Stars." I think that's a, quite a key chapter in you know your your artistic practice, where you kind of really try to stage um, a Cantonese opera performance uh, with you know Cantonese opera singers, but you know dressed up in like futuristic space outfits. Um, I also remember that work was also kind of staged or performed in Hong Kong as well in a few years ago. Maybe, Ming, would you mind also illustrate a little bit more about the, the concept of the work and how you really you know, materialize um, this piece back then? Yeah, everything is kind of linked. So I was here, I came several times, and uh, one of the times was with um, residency at Spring Workshop that Mimi Brown used to, uh, that was, was running at the time. And that's when I really delved deeper into the, the, the musical form of, of Cantonese opera. I could go and listen and watch and study it. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's such a complex uh, um, historical form. It's very hard to penetrate it you know, from, from, from an outsider's viewpoint. But I had, uh, I had the idea to try and create a science fiction Cantonese opera cinema project. <laughs> Uh, a long time ago, but it has taken so many steps in order to try and penetrate this kind of uh, this this world. Um, uh, an opportunity arrived uh, in 2014. Uh, was it 14 or 13? Uh, thereabouts, December 2013, actually. And uh, this was actually commissioned by M Plus when they still didn't have a, a venue. It was an off-site project, a part of a festival, uh, a performance festival curated by by M Plus. And I had the means to make, uh, conduct an, an experiment with young Cantonese opera actors and musicians from Hong Kong. And um, to do that, to try to find a methodology from going from page to stage, uh, we borrowed um, the script um, from um, uh, Solaris, from the film by Tarkovsky and the, and the book by Stanislav Lem. Um, can Cantonese opera be used <laughs> to, to express this very complex ideas about time and space and, uh, and, 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 and the future? And surprisingly, the answer was a resounding yes. Using classical Chinese, classical Cantonese, with metaphors that are timeless, uh, references to nature, to, to the human condition, it was possible to express some of these very, very complex time, uh, 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 concepts of, of, of existence, times, dimensions, uh, and sung, and sung as Cantonese opera uh, a verse, and um, and we staged it. Um, we had uh, a lot of doubtful uh, pure purists <laughs> audience members, but at the same time, a lot of uh, younger audience members who who actually could could actually uh, understand it and actually say that, yeah, it, it does actually make complete sense to, to do it. So I knew it was possible. Um, so the next step would be to actually write um, a new, uh, an original sci-fi Cantonese opera, which is still in the works. Wonderful, I look forward to it. Um, for Wei Kin, I also remember you also incorporate some Cantonese uh, <laughs> opera aesthetics in uh, the art of drag. I particularly remember maybe a, a series of work a few years ago called A Dream of Wholeness in Parts, where I vividly remember <laughs> there is like a protagonist, one of the protagonists actually is kind of recurrent, and it's also, they, he also appeared in um, It's Always You, your more recent uh, set of works. Um, I, I, I kind of I'm finding quite fascinating because you know you always put on the the drag uh, makeup, uh, but uh, you know it always reminds me of some certain like pecking opera aesthetics, the mask that you see, you know, in those performances. Um, at the beginning of your you know practice and and when you really try to incorporate these um, memories or aesthetics of it, like how how did you kind of also blend all these you know um, you know elements into um, the 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 art of drag, perhaps, but also particularly in um, the series of work. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think a dream of wholeness in parts uh, was probably um, the first film work where I was 
bringing in influences of like Cantonese and Peking opera into the actual characterizations. Um, and why I really wanted to do this is I was thinking for so long about um, the really distinct roles in Chinese opera um, and how strict they are, um, how, uh, you know, the, the, all the different roles or the four main roles of like the Dan, the Shang, the Chu and the Jing, like they all have different makeup styles that often the actors will learn to do themselves, um, completely different, uh, like uh, costuming, completely different gestural styles and ways of moving, um, uh, also completely different like vocalization um, styles, like they're all, you know, they could go to different schools to learn them. Um, and it was making me think about, um, you know, like uh, how within culture and society we also operate along um, like strict confines and categorizations, you know, from the moment you're born, you're socialized to act in a certain way. Um, so I brought the influences specifically from the makeup of the different roles in uh, Cantonese opera to the characters that I created for um, this film. So uh, one of the characters is called the Construct, um, and she has two different faces that are both influenced from the Dan or the female lead role. Um, one of them is her kind of like innocent um, or her good side, um, and uh, the colors in this face are like blue and uh, pink, which are associated with like honor and loyalty um, in Chinese opera. Um, and then the other face is her like um, evil, her bad side, um, her villain side, which uh, the colors are like green and yellow, which um, usually connote like cruelty or like selfishness um, in in the um, in Chinese opera traditions. Um, the other character is called the Universe, whose makeup is influenced from the Jing or the warrior role, um, and uh, the. Um, the makeup is like a, a flower in a landscape, and this character is made to think about the binary of an individual and its context. So the character kind of goes out into the world, um, moving through these different kind of dreamscapes uh, and scenes, and he's encountering his context. Um, you know, he speaks to a hole in a tree, he speaks to a bowl of noodles, and these things speak back to him, and the characters both are moving through um, the, the continuous dreams trying to kind of figure out their place um, in these worlds um, and their relationships to the worlds and their relationship to each other. Um, yeah, and then the universe also appears in my work It's Always You, which is um, my uh, boy band project. Um, as soon as I had like four masculine characters, I was like, okay, time to make the boy band. Um, because uh, similar to Rainbow, I was, uh, you know, I think, or like most queer kids, like, you know, like obsessed with boy bands growing up. And there's like this thing about, you know, like boy bands are like created by usually like capitalist machines to like create a really strong sense of desire um, in kids, teens. Um, so I wanted to create these four characters. Um, and each of them uh, symbolizes kind of a, a different area of research in my work. And this is illustrated in not only the makeup, but also the kind of gestural style. So in this work, it's a two channel, um, uh, the, the, main, the main meat of it is a two channel installation, a uh, video installation where on one screen you have kind of the glamour close ups of uh, one of the characters. On the other screen, you have the four of them dancing in a kind of diamond formation. Um, and the character who is at the front will be the same character who is having the close-ups on the screen. Each of them has their own dance that everybody performs um, uh, at the time when the character is at the front or being featured. And this is to think about the idea of like an active self um, that's presented in any given social situation. Um, like, as we all have an active self that we present in different situations, we're not the same person that we are. Um, with our families, as we are with our friends, as we are at work. Um, so these different characterizations and the um, uh, different uh, kind of like dances and embodiments that are presented at different times, all, 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 all performed by myself, are to trouble the idea of like an authentic self. 
Um, I had a pleasure to see this particular work uh, for a period of three months because I, you know, it's great. I'm very grateful to able to show It's Always You in my my show a, pre, uh, a few months ago, and I remember like a lot of audience they they stand in front of the two channel video and I feel like they're really entranced by it, and particularly about the character universe where I noticed in you know, It's Always You series. There is almost like an homage to Leslie Jung in terms of the, the outfit, the fashion, and the aesthetic, as well as all the like the postures even in the video. And I really love how you basically interweave um, Cantonese opera, drag, and canto pop just you know in one archetype in, in a single boy band. And uh, we can definitely talk more about the boy band uh, element in a in later section. And I wanted to extend this kind of um, musicality aspect with uh, Rainbow's expertise as a music producer and singer songwriter. So Cantonese opera, you know, of course it's you know a wonderful pop culture, so to say, genre, but it's also a form of music. And uh, despite you now, maybe it's not the most popular form of canto pop culture in Hong Kong. It's never, uh, nevertheless, it's still you know a, a form of Cantonese pop. And as a you know singer songwriter and music producer, you know and you know w working with so to say more traditional forms of uh, art and and uh, culture, you know how do you think you know uh, you know you, that it still has this maybe power of collectivity or there's like a social cohesion aspect. And, you know, as a, also an, a singer, songwriter, a musician who also works with white culture, you know, something that is more also, uh, you know, a traditional form of culture. How do you, how are you able, you know, in your work, you know, you try to incorporate all of these uh, traditional forms and sort of say more contemporary uh, medium? It's mm, a great question. Well, I think for me, there's a parallel between contemporary pop music and Cantonese opera in that it is made for a mass audience. It's for, you know, it's for everybody. And um, I had a classical music background, um, but I moved into pop music because I was, you know, I, I love that popular music is democratic, supposedly, anyway. Um, but it's more inviting and there's a sort of, um, you know, understanding of um, idioms and it's actually really rigorous and really complicated and it's really hard, hard to write a good pop song. Um, so I think Cantonese opera is kind of the same. There's a lot of rigor in the training. Um, the musicality is incredible. The way that people could project their voices without any ampl amplification um, in the past. Um, there's so much technique in it. And so I find it quite fascinating to draw from the gestures, the movements, um, and the sounds, the kind of traditional, drawing on the traditional sounds, singing styles, the melismas of the voice, pitch bending. And I think what is really, really interesting is that the, the sung elements is more conversational, like Cantonese style, but dramatized. And um, you know, a lot of the Cantonese pop songs that um, we listen to, you know, in our childhood is kind of, it's not really spoken Cantonese the way it's sung. So what's cool about the older songs is that it's almost more authentic in the way that it kind of uses the language in um, more everyday forms. And I've been finding parallels also in the music you um, mentioned earlier, Wei Tao music, which, so I might give a quick um, explanation of what Wei Tao is. Uh, so it is the uh, first settlers of Hong Kong, uh, Wai Taoyuan. Uh, they settled here in the Song Dynasty and I have heritage to Wai Tao culture through my mum. They traditionally lived in like walled villages and that's why they're called Wai Tao, like Wai Chunyan. Um, what I th found um, to be really interesting about the music sung by Wai Tao people is that mostly it was, su it was sung by women and women weren't allowed to go to school. So their way of um, passing on knowledge was through storytelling and through singing these songs. So the songs are extremely um, conversational, but um, like being what you were saying before about the metaphor that's embedded into these olden songs, uh, referring to nature and um, kinship and social rituals, and they're so rich with knowledge, um, very specific also to 
the geography. And I've been drawing upon these um, ancient melodies to apply it to contemporary culture now as we kind of figure out, you know, place and time, these universal questions of what it means to exist as a person in this world. So I think on a musical level, there's um, a lot of beauty in the simplicity of some of these melodies, but there's so much expression as well in the way that the voice performs these melodies. And the lyrical content is also really um, complicated and layered and definitely can be applied to a contemporary context. Um, I remember um, a few months ago you were uh, in a residency in Eaton, a hotel, where you also did a really wonderful performance with a, a song that, you know, called The Bridal Lament, you know, where you tackled some quite heavier uh, topics within Waito culture and maybe in relation to the patriarchal like system and womanhood in particular. And I, I find it very, uh, like I'm quite in awe because like it's such a heavy history and, you know, but at the same time you kind of blend with sort of say like nightclub setting, you know, pop music. And it's, it's almost, there is like a, um, a, a moment of emancipation in, in that kind of uh, nightclub scene in Eton. And I would love to learn more about that particular performance and the song and, and um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about uh, this particular aspect in um, your heritage? So the Bridal Lament is a ritual of Waitao women. Basically, they were um, traditionally uh, forced into arranged marriages. So a marriage for a woman was seen as actually a very sad thing. Once they were married off to a new village, they were, their ties to their home were severed, and also they never belonged really to the groom's family. Plus, a lot of these women didn't even see their groom until literally the wedding day. So, um, I remember a lot of the elders, when they were sharing their stories with me, they often talked about how growing up in a very patriarchal society, they had no rights. Um, one woman, when she gave birth to a daughter, the mother-in-law and the husband refused to visit her in hospital. Um, so these are living memories, which to me, you know, feels really shocking. But um, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff still, you know, exists. Um, and so for me, the, the, the bridal lament is a really important metaphor for um, uncovering, I guess, the, the resilience of the women in Waitao culture and the way that they dealt with uh, this feeling of powerlessness. So this ritual involved the woman, bride-to-be, um, climbing up the loft in her home and then inviting each member of her family and village members to come and say goodbye to her for three days and three nights. She would cry and sing these songs called Bridal Laments or Hokkago. And each of the songs um, expresses her pain. They were kind of like um, defiance as well, but extremely codified so she wouldn't get in trouble. And the beauty of musical performance is that it's ephemeral. So, and it wasn't trans transcribed, so she couldn't get in trouble. She couldn't be, you know, yelled at afterwards. But it was her sanctioned time to protest, basically. And so, um, I, I, how I stumbled across this music was a couple of years ago, I asked my mum, oh, I actually really want to learn Waitao because it's a disappearing dialect. Um, and it's crazy to think that that was the language that was spoken here for many, many centuries, predominantly. Um, and my mum was like, okay, well, I know that you could actually pick up a lot more Waitao through music, but she, her generation never learnt the songs. Um, by the 60s, it was modernising and everything, so she, they didn't sing the songs. But she put me in touch with these grannies here who live in uh, Long Yatao in Fanling. And they are doing a um, social project at the moment to preserve some of these songs. So they've recorded CDs, made a documentary. And um, now I'm, I guess I've been collaborating with them for over five years to try and learn the songs as someone who embodies this culture. But at the same time, I don't want it to be like in behind glass in a museum. And so the nightclub is a way for me to keep this tradition alive and to evolve it and to let it express, I guess, um, my kind of 
diasporic lens as well because there is a notion of authenticity in the way I'm doing it too because technically my mum married out of the village and so I'm not really Waitau but no one else is doing this work so you know um, it's a challenging task but it's also extremely rewarding. I noticed something that you mentioned is very interesting which is the, how performance are ephemeral where it's like there's this transitoriness where it's, it's it just happened at a moment and it cannot be traced, but at the same time it really activates a particular space, particularly, you know, for, for the example that you mentioned. I also want to kind of, kind of expand a little bit on this idea because for all three of your works are, you know, performative in a way, you know, it can be performative in a video work, but it's also sometimes take place in live performances. Um, of course, each of you also do, so to say, tangible works in, in your practice, but I can see predominantly, you know, performance is definitely something like a, a you know, a core element in all of you. Um, besides the transitoriness, perhaps, why, what, what kind of, uh, what really draw you to performance and that you really want to use this as the main medium to convey whatever messages that you would like to express uh, um, through your works? Maybe, um, Waken, if you would like to share a little bit more on that? Yeah, um, I just want to draw on some things that like also uh, Ming and Rainbow have said, like something about like storytelling through song and how that exists in both pop music and in Cantonese opera. And then also, you know, I think we all use like um, elements of Cantonese opera or, or pop and, uh, and futurism, like in kind of elements of performance. And for me, like bringing all of these things together, it feels really necessary or it almost kind of just uh, happened naturally like as somebody who is trying to make sense of my experience in a world that like does not represent my experience. Um, like looking at uh, um, like my family's history or like cultures that um, uh, my family like uh, immigrated away from and thinking about um, how that exists in my body now thinking about how to create a representation of um, these experiences that are often like, uh, yeah, marginalized, like to bring them through in storytelling in my practice, through film, through performance, um, and bringing in elements of like science fiction and speculative fiction like is necessary, like as a medium that has always been used to, um, you know, often like talk about what's like really going on, like um, like science fiction uh, in um, like Chinese culture, like during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of intellectuals started writing like fantasy and science fiction in order to sublimate the meanings um, uh, of of what they were trying to say. And you know, similarly, like. Um, uh, how um, futurism exists in social justice movements like uh, cyber feminism or Afrofuturism, like there, it's necessary to try to think about the future or to use fantasy to represent, um, you know, experiences that you actually have which are not being um, represented or which you are kind of being told are actually a fantasy, like in real life. Um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely how these things come together in my work. Thank you. Um, Ming, do you have any uh, like insights on that? Yeah. yeah, where do we start? I mean, as, as artists, let's start because we're artists. I mean, what are the, one of the roles, I guess, is to kind of be, be uh, not just embodying, uh, but also mm -hmm. to, be, to be the bridge, to be, to be the mm -hmm. translators mm -hmm. of some of these uh, knowledges mm -hmm. that, uh, that are in danger of disappe disappearing. And I, I, I look back into history, so if, even though I'm trying to think about uh, notions of the future, I, my research draws me back and back further back into history. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, performing performance uh, in Cantonese, in, uh, in, in, in popular culture, uh, as a form of resistance, the, the actual persistence of Cantonese language and culture and of the, of the, of the region. Um, 
it, there are so many instances uh, in, in not too not too recent history where it's, it's hap it happens and keeps on happening. Um, uh, one example, um, two examples. In, in the cinema industry, where uh, Cantonese players in the field were, were, were quite dominant, uh, from Shanghai in the beginning, and then the, because of the Japanese invasion, moved down south and eventually to Hong Kong as a safe space. Uh, but uh, there, there, were, there, there were moments when um, the, the central government wanted to suppress Cantonese language movies, because they were sort of becoming too popular. There was... Uh, there, there, there's a kind of um, uh, a knack for, for Cantonese producers to speak to the everyman. They were using the vernacular. They were you know, using trends from, from the West. They were innovative. Um, and and um, so th there, there were periods when Cantonese films were deemed and music were deemed to be too popular. And there were actions to try and suppress them. Uh, if you go back further, Cantonese opera itself, as an art form, was um, was also a tool in um, in, in actual resistance and and, and, and revolution. Um, we're going back like late nineteenth uh, uh, century when Cantonese opera operated uh, in red boats along the Pearl River Delta. This is bef before the emergence of the urban centers of Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and, and Macau. Op opera troops were operating in boats. They were also uh, uh, in, co in cahoots with, uh, with, with kung fu, with kung fu uh, monks, who were also being, um, uh, what do you call it, persecuted by the, by the Qing government, who burned down the temples. And, and because of the kinship in, in, in southern kung fu, they could hide on these uh, Cantonese opera red boats, and they could travel undetected through the waterways. And there were actually historical incidences when um, Cantonese opera actors would don the Ming Dynasty kind of costumes, warrior costumes, to lead the masses to, to, to revolt against uh, uh, the, the Qing Dynasty. And this is kind of recorded. And much more incidences. The further you look back, the, the knowledge is from, from, from nature, from environment, and, and, from, and, from, and um, from living by the water. It's, it's becoming so much more relevant again today. So, um, yeah. I remember you also, in some of your works, you kind of manipulate a little bit of uh, uh, Hong Kong cinema. Where I remember there is a work you kind of um, employ, you know, In the Mood for Love by Wong Kar Wai, but you kind of switch all the characters and, you know, ask maybe like a Caucasian protagonist to speak Cantonese uh, and, and in, uh, for the narration. And I want to kind of also touch upon, you know, like we, we used to have these four heavenly kings, you know, in, in Cantonese pop history, you know, which I remember, Ming, you reminded me that actually, you know, it's not, it's not only used in the 80s and 90s, actually back much earlier on, there was already this term. Um, perhaps I, I, you know, because you, you have these kind of, um, you know, knowledge in, in cinematic history. Would you mind sharing a little bit more, you know, how actually, you know, the, we, we, like the entertainment industry actually used like the, the term of Four Heavenly Kings and perhaps, if you don't mind, share your version of Four Heavenly Queens. <laughs> yeah, I was always more interested in the queens than the kings, you know. Give me Anita Mui any day, right? <laughs> Um, but the term of the, this Four Heavenly Kings actually has been used. Uh, it, ca it came out with the phenomenon of, of, uh, of mass culture, mass communication, uh, the, 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 the emergence of the, of the, the, the superstar. Yeah? And this is when we had uh, mass communication technologies uh, coming, into, uh, 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 coming into an interface with, uh, with, uh, with music, with, with cinema. Uh, we're talking really about gramophone records. We're talking about cinema. This would be twenties, uh, thirties, uh, forties, and uh, and in and the Cantonese were kind of like uh, one of the first actually to exploit uh, this this um, the, the, this connection. And so, with uh, with the rise of these urban centers uh, in uh, in Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Macau, these are where if you if you remember if, if you think back to that time. It was always, the people were always on, on the move uh, due to d lots of different reasons, seeking a better life, uh, famine, uh, uh, political unrest, uh, um, uh, war. 
people were always on the move and coming down south and um, and uh, and also f uh, we, we of course with the, with the, with the, with colon colonialization you all also have this this kind of a, um, push to create these commercial centers the, these port cities and so the urban kind of centers grew and we have what we have is modern cities and there was a demand of course for entertainment uh, and uh, so there we had tea houses, opera houses, we had uh, uh, theaters, and with the advent of uh, technology, with, uh, with gramophone records and cinemas, uh, came also in its wake the emergence of uh, the celebrities, superstars, who never before in history had such a mass uh, appeal uh, across audiences. It was so uh, easy, easily accessible, right? And so the Seidai Teen Wong was already in place to talk about these like, uh, Cantonese opera stars who would be making uh, films during the day and at night performing these uh, innovative new operas. Uh, uh, and that's a kind of a precursor to what we have today. Um, in terms of, so we have, of course, Four Heavenly Kings, and I'm actually very interested in knowing what's your version of Four Heavenly Queens, if you don't mind sharing. You know, it still happens. All the kings are not just kings. They're also queens. There's been a long tradition of gender play, right? In traditional Cantonese opera, particularly in, uh, in Chinese opera, but particularly in Cantonese opera. You have the emergence of male impersonators, female actors impersonating male roles, which really took off um, because of the diasporic uh, history. If you think about it, um, there were all these like uh, mainly male immigrants who migrated down south to Nanyang, to Singapore, across the Pacific to, to America. And there were restrictions on the number of women who could, who could travel. It was mainly male laborers, right? And these troops would go and perform for these communities. And of course, they want to see women. They want to see real women on stage. And in Hong Kong, there were all these all-women troops who were, all, who were always kind of sec on a secondary level uh, in this part of the world. But once they go across uh, to, to these diasporic communities, they took over. They became the, the, the superstars. Yam Kim Fai started from an all-women troupe, right? And this was also the time of uh, so-called modernity. So you, had, you started to have mixed gender on stage. So there would... You, you get to see finally a real man and a real woman on stage at the same time. Before that, it was just all, all men. And then the women became so popular, they, they created, uh, they were the, the, the headliners. And they began to even like uh, make hybrid, hybrid roles where, you know, you have the, the sheng, which is the, the kind of poet, the scholar, the, the erudite uh, male, male protagonist from a... Uh, who, 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 who got first prize in the imperial examination. Yeah? And, and the warrior, yeah? who, who knew all the kung fu, and who could fight. And the women, uh, act in, the, the, the male impersonators, made this hybrid role of the scholar warrior. They could fight, but they are also very handsome, and they could spout poetry, and they could fight with a spear, but they could also fight with a brush. Uh, and this is really the precursor of the, the, the kind of uh, uh, default casting we have in Hong Kong, which is two women playing the, the lead couple. It came up through the movies, through Yam Kim Fai and Park Suit Sin, there was a golden age, but of course there were, there were the, 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 the forerunners to that. And it's still, it's, it's still very much the, 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 the norm today in, in, in Cantonese opera circles that you have two women playing the, the lead couple. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's true. No, um, you know, like uh, I really love how you see these, uh, ele you know, history as you know precursor of pop culture, and you know, like as you mentioned, there, there, there are you know golden ages or golden era in pop culture in, in Hong Kong, where we usually we see eighties, the eighties and nineties are kind of like in the peak. And you know there has been certain period of time that we really don't find much enjoyment or excitement in like kennel pop or entertainment industry. But you know, uh, four to three years, three to four years ago, you know we have this local sensation of a 12-member boy band, which is cast by a local TV broadcast company, and really, you know, work the city up in a frenzy. 
And, uh, you know, at the beginning, you know, they were kind of like laughing stocks almost. Like, oh, you know, you're just copying K-pop bands and stuff. But, you know, it's really maybe like two years ago, they really like become so popular that each member has their own fan clubs. You know, their fans just really go in public spaces and, you know, fundraise and buy all these billboard ads, you know, for their birthdays. And it's, it's really quite spectacular. And, um, you know, I, you know, personally, I, I really see, you know, of course, the emergence of this mirror boy band has a lot of, you know, entertainment with, you know, the social landscape in Hong Kong. But I'm actually, you know, for, particularly for this, you know, panel discussion, you know, boy bands, it's definitely not something, not new invention. It has been, you know, the existing, you know, throughout music history. And I want to, you know, particularly ask uh, Waken about that because, you know, in, in, in It's Always You, you create this kind of archetype of boy band where you have four very distinct personas. And, you know, for, for you, like how, like why, why would you choose particularly these four archetypes, first of all? And then, um, you know, rather than getting into this very conventional um, portrayal, you really add like your really personal flair into all these characters. I really would love to learn more about your thoughts on this kind of boy band formula, but at the same time, how you queer it uh, in your way. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, for me, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like boy band is like this, like, you know, capitalist construction. Usually it's like uh, people who are kind of scouted or like gathered together and each member of the boy band is kind of like individualized to have like, you know, like a singular personality. There's like the cute one, there's like the more serious one. Um, and so I wanted to use this kind of like, um, this medium of like, uh, I don't know, the extreme individu individualization of characters um, in boy bands through capitalism to create like this like extreme desire um, in consumers um, to create uh, uh, these individual characters um, or to like develop the characterizations within the boy band. So there's four members in the boy band. Um, there's the universe, as I mentioned, each one uh, like represents like a different area uh, of practice or research or um, interest. So the universe, who is also in A Dream of Wholeness and Parts, whose character is really influenced by like uh, Tony Leung and Leslie Jung, like um, uh, In the Mood for Love, um, whose face is uh, representative of the binary of an individual in its context. Um, there's the storyteller um, who's, uh, who represents um, an idea of storytelling within culture and how this also creates um, binaries and how storytelling is kind of like a, a, a main tool of knowledge production and culture. You know, it exists in all, all of these areas of truth production, like, um, uh, you know, history is storytelling, religion always has a, a book of stories at its center. You know, storytelling is in the scientific process of like, you know, gathering narratives from data. Um, and creates like a, uh, you know, truth and fiction. Um, another character is uh, the one who came out of um, my meditation practice and thinking about the binary of like mind and body and self and other. Um, and then there's Wai King, who's like my more fun uh, exploration of masculinity and like fantasy masculinity and what this can look like on my body, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, boy bands are so, like, as you mentioned, they're not, uh, they're definitely not new, like, and the history of, like, the Se Dai Teen Wong, like, how it's existed before, and then um, it existed in this kind of golden age of canto pop, um, and then the boy band is now coming back with this, like, 12-member um, uh, band called Mirror, um, which is extraordinary to have like 12 members. Of course, not all of them can be like super popular, but they all like, you know, the main ones kind of have their own like cult of personality um, almost. Uh, and like actually, like all of these, like the Sei Dai Tin Wong uh, and um, Mirror were really important influences for It's Always You. Um, uh, the actual like logo of Mirror influenced the um, the setup of the screen installation of um, It's Always You. It's like two doors or like mirrors or like windows next to each other, which is also very similar to the logo of um, the band BTS, the K-pop band. 
Um, but um, amazingly, like the byline for the band Mirror, like if you go on their Instagram, it's like together we reflect unlimited possibilities. Um, and like this really came, like it, it drew me back to the idea of like fantasy in boy bands and how important fantasy is in boy bands, not only in the kind of consumer and like imagining your relationship to these characters, but also like, you know, the construction of characters um, in the boy bands. Um, yeah, I think like fantasy is, uh, you know, it's really important in, it exists in every form of storytelling. You know, you could say there's no such thing as objective knowledge. There's some element of fantasy in every story that we tell. Um, and especially in Cantonese opera, I think like fantasy um, exists so much in, you know, we're talking earlier about how, uh, um, like within Cantonese opera, these two female actors could live their relationship on stage and like famously uh, they're said to have been in a like lesbian relationship, but you know, they couldn't live this out publicly. They could only live it out in this space that was fantasy. Um, so, you know, in this way, it's like the reality of their experience could only be portrayed in fantasy. And I think there definitely is this element in all of these forms of storytelling that we're talking about. I think the element of fantasy is also, you know, quite daring to me because, um, the, you know, and for when showing your work in a parasite, we built, you know, like this teenager bedroom diorama. And I really want to, you know, resist that you know, conventional white cube space for your works and something different from previous presentations It's that we, um, you know, use these custom made acrylic stands to showcase your um, makeup wipes rather than just hang on a, on a wall um, because, you know, just some a sort of anecdote, you know, I used to be a huge Lady Gaga fan and I, when I saw your works for the first time, I actually imagine like, okay, so like a Gaga fan, you know, went to the concert and, you know, with the makeup and an outfit on. And then after, you know, this trip of fantasy and extravagance and, you know, going back home, you know, removing the makeup is almost like a, almost like a ritual because, you know, though the, the makeup that is uh, left on the makeup wipes are like the residue of a sort of embodiment. And I, when I saw those makeup wipes, I, it really reminds me of my teenage, teenager memory uh, of going to these concerts and trying to you know, embody a certain character, maybe for escapism, but also with a sense of rebellion as well. Um, so uh, talking about fantasy, you know, pop culture, of, of course, is you know, an elixir you know, of escapism in a way. But at the same time, you know, it's, of course, it's nothing new in, in terms of academic and academia where pop culture is definitely a source, uh, you know, of uh, references and inspiration for critical uh, studies or critical theories. But I think something that's quite new or you know, that's pretty much opened up a different potentiality as to how maybe we can envision like the power of fandom because fandom is basically a collectivity of different desires, different aspirations, uh, fantasy, of course. And I think there always been like more negative connotation towards these more adolescent or you know more emotionally it charged uh, kind of uh, expression, but there's always a beauty in it because you know in in you know in works that revolve uh, performances you know during all the works you know you you also kind of really restage a certain fantasy, recreating a different alternative space for your audience. So I actually would love to know, you know, your thoughts from uh, from each of the speaker, as in, like, how can we reimagine, you know, fandom as a group, as a collective, and how, you know, those, you know, uh, different desires, different emotions, affects may actually offer us something different. We can use, you know, more on a level of desire to help us to make sense of our world, because, you know, it's, uh, you know, our world is just getting more crazier than ever and rather than maybe continue to kind of um, resist or avoid these kind of desires and fantasies, perhaps we can actually make use of it. So I'm actually quite curious uh, hearing, you know, what are your thoughts on you know, this particular aspect? Um, Rainbow, do you have anything to share? Sure. I think, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is this um, 
category of fan and saying like va fan versus artist or fan versus idol because I think like we've chatted about how we're, we're all fans, you know, like we're all fans of the things that we do, of our idols and especially now with social media being, um, you know, this platform where ordinary people could become, you know, viral and have that kind of global reach. I think this idea of... Um, like blurring the, found, uh, the boundary of what fandom is is really interesting. I think that the power of desire, of fantasy and of um, imagination is really potent to think about alternative worlds as you know, we've all talked about in our, uh, in our works today. Um, I think on a more personal level, <coughs> having come from a pop music background, um, I guess over the years I have interacted with, I guess, fans who follow my music and I find a lot of inspiration from them, um, either through their interpretations of my songs. I think for me what's quite interesting is when I write a song, it's usually just in my bedroom, I'm a, like a bedroom producer as well, so I don't have any like fancy equipment, it's all very DIY, I literally sing in my cupboard with clothes all around me as my like vocal booth um, and so it's this very um, I guess introspective and intimate uh, experience and process that I have yet then when I present it to the public it's very voyeur like I guess the experience is quite voyeuristic for the fan and it's quite exhibitionistic for me and so that moment of contact where someone um, has their own sort of interpretation and then represents it to me, there's a really um, amazing feedback loop that opens my eyes up to the way that music and other art forms can travel and inspire in others, you know, um, their own ways of navigating the complexities of the world. So a lot of the songs that I deal with, like identity issues or kind of navigating change or being between cultures, you know, when I've toured around the world, other people have kind of come up and said, well, you know, thank you for that song because it really helped me to, um, you know, navigate a really difficult period in my life. And that always shocks me because I know, like, I've been that person with, you know, my idols and I know the importance of those songs. So um, to me, that's, yeah, it's like the fan is also giving me so much more um, energy to keep doing what I do. So, yeah. Fans. You know, whenever I go and watch Cantonese opera performances, I'm the youngest one in the audience, right? Uh, but I guess the, 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 the task is to, 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 to see how you can um, uh, promote forms of communication and expression across, uh, across borders, borders of age, nationality, language. I, I think it's such a wonderful project, the, the, the Bridal Lament project. I'm so in awe. Of the, of the potential and outreach of this, that it can reach so many different kind of like uh, 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 people with different perspectives. Um, but at, at the same time, you, you know, you're not gonna be able to please everybody, right? Uh, it's, uh, the task of the artist is actually to kind of be clear about um, uh, uh, what do you wanna do? Where, where do you position yourself? Um, where, where do you want to operate? I think it's also another uh, uh, key question for me. Uh, working in the in the club for one for one thing, I think it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 it speaks to pop popular culture. If you can connect some of these knowledges from from the, from the, from the, from other spheres, I think that would be an accomplishment. I think also there's a lot more curiosity and hunger from uh, from audiences uh, for something which is um, less mainstream perhaps more uh, uh, personal to, 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 to the artist, to the performer, and, and not just about your own, uh, 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 what do you call it, individual uh, histories. I think there is a general ex uh, hunger for, um, for more stories from overlooked communities uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and perspectives across the board, across the world. Uh, I think we're, we're entering a kind of more interesting time. I'm sure it has, it has to do with uh, social media as well, that you are able to actually find uh, people who, who, who have the same kind of interests as you, as you do. 
Um, so it w it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, time now. Um, uh, and to see some of these works coming out, I, I, I feel gratified in a way that, uh, that, there is, uh, that there is, uh, there's, there's going to be a bigger and bigger audience, I think. Yeah. Um what was I going to say? I, I was thinking about how you were talking about going to like Lady Gaga concerts earlier, um, and uh, I think fandom is like a, it's a big part of um, my work or like my influences. Like when I start a project or a new area of research, or you know, it, it usually is because I'm like a fan of that particular thing. I was a fan of drag before I started doing drag. I was a fan of boy bands before I became a boy band. Um, like it's um, it's it's uh, fandom is like inspiration. It's also like a, f a fantasy. Like you know, you go up to the concert, you go dressed as Gaga, and it's a um, it's an escape, right? Uh, and that kind of sense of like escape or like fantasy is like really important. And I think about um, how drag for me was like um, an escape. Uh, it it was this kind of like play where I could be something else. I could look like something else and then move through the club and be treated like something else and have this um, like uh, opportunity to like see things from a different perspective. It's, um, you know, you kind of allow yourself to like disappear into something when you are allowing yourself to become like a fan of something. Um, a lot of, uh, a few other, um, uh, drag queens that I know like started as like fans of drag or like one fan um, one drag queen I know started as like a fan of Jedward and somehow that like morphed into like becoming this like quite wild um, like em wildly embodied drag queen um, but also this kind of fandom it's yeah it's a sense of escape but it's also like um, you know the fantasy is really important um, to be able to like escape. It's like to be able to escape kind of like stri strict confines of your life through listening to a boy band, through going to a Cantonese opera to allow yourself to exist in a different realm. And I am thinking about also how for a lot of trans people, like drag is often like a first step to trying on something else. Like, I mean, that's what it was for me actually. It was through a process of doing drag and like putting on and taking off these like fantasy embodiments that I realized that actually, you know, the thing that was the fantasy was my everyday life and actually, you know, I wasn't a woman. Um, so I think, yeah, these, these processes of allowing yourself to be completely absorbed in something else is, are, they're, they're really important, especially as artists. Thank you so much for all of your sharing. I, I, you know, to me, you know, as a curator, I always remind myself not to just like, be in the ivory tower and do my own academic research and stuff. So it's really nice to be able to hear all of your sharings and because, you know, it's it's really like fused, in, you know, filled with passion. And I think artists is also a fan, isn't it? Like you're, you're a fan of certain um, artistic expression, you're a fan of certain topic, and then you use your own filter or lens and translate them, channel into something, you know, pretty wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I think one, one of the things that I really learned from this panel discussion is that, you know, yeah, it's of course, like performance and they offer a certain escapism, but that form of escapism is not like trying to avoid uh, certain problems or realist reality. It's actually offering us a different perspective or different way of perceiving um, reality because uh, our daily life is pretty much a blend of reality and fantasy. It's not like that clear cut. And what I what I feel really uh, you know grateful about you know about Kento pop or pop culture is that despite it's such a you know people still regard maybe uh, maybe a little bit lowbrow or it's just pop culture. It you know it's like an industry product so to say. But even if it is you know there are so many fascinating elements and references that are intertwined with our contemporary social development of how you know maybe it's a, a forum, a channel to um, address uh, you know, social traumas, recent or historical ones. And I think this is very important because can of pop or, or Cantonese opera or any forms of, of pop culture, it, it ultimately there's always, a, it's almost like a, a medium for us to, to uh, be present. You know, no matter you kind of incorporate you know, historical 
uh, references or speculating a future. And so this is, uh, I think, we, I have a really wonderful panel discussion today, and I want to hope guys give them a round of applause to our guest speakers. So maybe we can open up uh, the floor and see if anyone has any questions for uh, the free artists over here, or in a particular, you know, want to express certain ideas after hearing this panel discussion, perhaps? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, great panel and discussion. I was just curious to hear you about uh, Fei Wong, uh, listening to your discussion now, immediately think of Wong Kar Wai, but there is another figure, Fei Wong, and I think they collaborated. I also think that Fei Wong started singing in Cantonese, uh, although she was born in uh, China, so yeah, whatever you, you want to share. Are you a fan of Fei Wong? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I love Fei Wong. In fact, my outfit today is a bit inspired by her 90s wardrobe. Um, yeah, Fei Wong, for me, um, I look up to her quite a lot. I think she's quite an uh, interesting um, persona. Like, I guess because when she was starting out, she was also copying a lot of um, other artists like Björk. Um, and so now, I guess, she's quite a chameleon and I really enjoy that about her um, art artistry. Um, I love, you know, the way that she sings in multiple languages, so that inspires me to write in lots of languages too. But, yeah, she's like a fashion icon. She's, you know, she's um, an actress, so very talented. For me, again, it's that kind of nostalgic feeling of this, like, 90s idol that, to me, when, yeah, before having internet and I moved to Australia, like the Fei Wong CD or cassette would be um, taken out of the box that we, you know, this little cardboard box that my family had brought over to Australia on the plane and we'd listen to the Fei Wong over and over again, the love Dawa over and over again, Kofu Seng. Um, and until the tapes were literally like falling apart and same with the VHSs that we had, we like taped a whole bunch of TV shows and movies that we liked and then we'd watch them over and over again. And then the next step would be um, we started to borrow pirated videos from like the local Chinatown video store. And what I loved about that was um, you'd watch one TV series and then all of a sudden you'd get this like white noise and then the end of another series would suddenly be attached to the end of it because they've just obviously overdubbed heaps of them. So for me, that kind of nostalgic um, analog form of media um, is really informative for my practice and these kind of residues of memories of fantasy of fragments in the way that we kind of, in a very hodgepodge DIY style, like mash them together before, yeah, the internet, where now everything is accessible just like this, you know, streaming services, you can just Google something straight away. So I guess for me, the, the power of this like image of Fei Wong from the 90s encapsulates this moment in time where the, the fantasy of returning home for me and being in Hong Kong and being with my family um, was really embodied in a lot of that kind of analog technology of the tapes, the, the, um, the, the long distance phone calls where you had to like go through like a little card and then wait to be transferred, blah, 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 all the, that kind of like difficulty of connecting. Um, yeah, hence why I use it in my music a lot. Fei Wong, are we still on Fei Wong? Isn't she the one who kind of <laughs> became a recluse and became a Buddhist nun? <laughs> Wasn't she the one? Fei Wong? Uh, not sure about that. Uh, the one who is into <laughs> gossip, or fans gossip? Fei Wong became a kind of like a... Uh, she, became, she, she, she became a nun, didn't she? Like a Buddhist nun? I think she's on TV still. and She's married I to so. Nicholas. Nicholas. <laughs> no, like something about Fei Wong that really uh, draws my attention is that I, I remember reading an article back then where, you know, like, in the, like uh, you know, within like LGBTQ community, you know, like Diva is such an important icon for, for the group. And I remember reading like, you know, like why some fans are such, you know, like, diehard fans for Madonna or Lady Gaga or Fei Wong in, in, in Asia. And there's one thing that I find very inspiring is that the frequency of their voice 
it's actually something that draws their different attention. Some of the fans maybe to identify themselves more like non-binary, more androgynous, and they actually find Lady Gaga's more deeper tone more attractive and more able to identify with, with Fei Wang perhaps because she has this distinct Bjork-esque you know, kind of uh, tone and accent or, or, or just the way of singing, it also attracts like a very different crowd. And I find it very interesting how even like the element of sound and, you know, which is core in musicality and music structure, that becomes, you know, something that affects our um, desire and how, who we identify with. I think this, you know, Fei Wong, this character, you know, I listen, when I was still in my mom's uh, womb, you know, I, I remember I, my mom pretty much played you know, their albums and uh, face albums over and over. And you know, when I was born, whenever he heard you know Fei Wong songs, I would just stare at the stereo because it's just so you know memorable to me, even when I was just a fetus. So I think this is I think this also shows how you know tr uh, pop music is actually so you know like. Uh, go beyond and transcend, uh, you know, temporality and even like so deep down that it affects how we see ourselves and how we, we actually want to embody different um, icons, so to say. Yeah. Any more questions for our guest speakers or about the topic? Okay. Um, maybe I just have uh, one more question for all of you. Um, so I, at the beginning, I asked about your anecdote, you know, your first encounter of pop music, uh, pop culture. After all these years right now, what are your, like, most fresh obsession of, uh, in pop culture? <laughs> mm. Right now? Yeah. Cancel, cancel pop. Or just pop culture in general. like I'm out of touch. To be honest, I feel out of touch with pop culture. It's going too fast for me. The TikTok dances or the... <laughs> um, Waking, do you have anything in mind? Um, I, most recently I've been um, uh, like trying to get into uh, like old kung fu movies. Uh -huh. um, I've watched Enter the Dragon a few times. Um, trying to think about like... Uh, um, I'm trying to think. Of, I've been I've been uh, working through um, uh, some anger recently, or not recently. I think my whole life. I think. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. I think there's there's something about um, uh, this thing that I think is a similar experience with a lot of people who are socialized as female in um, Chinese families. Uh, you know, not really. We don't really know how to express our anger, um, so I've been trying to like watch these like um, these like fighting movies of like you know men going and getting revenge and to to try to think about constructing a character who is um, you know like just very literally like battling their demons. I feel like. Going back to pop music, it's not, uh, I guess it's pop music for them, but I wanted to share another anecdote about on my last trip after um, the Eton residency, <clears throat> I visited the Waitao grannies for the first time in three years, like since COVID. And unfortunately, you know, because they are so elderly, a few of them are either um, quite sick, um, someone's passed away, you know, like, so I guess for me, there is an urgency to preserve and to connect with, you know, the pop music of their day, which was a way for them to navigate this very complicated situation that the women lived in. But one thing that for me was really healing was when I visited them, and visited them in the village, one of the grannies had, um, she's developed dementia in the last three years, so she didn't remember who I was. Um, when I arrived at the community centre, they all greeted me. It was really, really beautiful. I gave them a hug. And then the one in, uh, with dementia in the wheelchair, her daughter was pushing her around and they were like, oh, this is Rainbow. She's from Australia. She's come back to visit. And she was like, I have no idea who she is. And they're like, oh, she can sing your song because she has, like, this particular granny has her own special song, which was called Fish Song, Bird Song. And... 
and, th and that was one of the songs I had learnt and um, it's um, displayed in one of the pictures there. So I just, it felt so natural. I just immediately started singing the song to her and she looked up at me incredulous and she was like, how do you know this song? And then I kept singing and then she joined in. Like, so she doesn't, you know, she, she, but every single word for her is, you know, just perfect. She was like singing the song and we were holding hands, looking at each other. And I was like, crying like a baby like weeping and it was like for me it was like I left my body somehow and I felt like time just kind of collapsed into this one precious stone or something like I didn't feel like I was in me anymore I felt like I was on another plane with her so it was extremely touching and when we finished singing the song she said to me she's like you must keep singing you must keep singing this and then her daughter also, because her daughter didn't learn how to sing the songs, and she pulled me aside and she said to me, she was like, I'm so happy, you know, how to sing my mum's song. You know, she's really sick now, but now I know the song lives in you. And so I think that's why I'm a fan of this Waitau music, because it's, it is disappearing. And unless I'm a fan and unless I do that work with rigour and with a lot of study and with a lot of compassion... Um, and with collaborations, you know, with the, with the grannies and with the community, it is going to disappear. So, yeah, I've got to be a fan. <laughs> oh, I can't beat that. <laughs> this is, I'm a fan. I, I really want to listen to this, really. Can, huh? I sing a few lines. Would you? Should the I? fish and flower, please. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'll stand. No, no, I'll sit. Uh, so, okay, this is fish song, bird song that was taught to me by Granny Meng Fong, uh, Meng, Meng Fong Kuen. <coughs> A back sends a mulang, O dans a dog song. A tat you fong chai tao yao tang so ma. A night tao kao chok tang wu wang. Wokoksatamnan Oh,难难的早空门 Thank you. Really beautiful. Really touching. Thank you, Rainbow. Thank you. I think, um, yeah. Thank you so much for you know ending this panel discussion with such a finale. And thank you again for everyone to be here today. And uh, yes, so. Thank you. Please, a big round of applause.